Hi guys and welcome to this new tutorial of our series Blender for Production. My name is Helge Maus from Pixel Train. After I finished my last two Blender for Production series, one was the Compositor, the other one was the Blender to Nuke workflow, I decided that I now want to tackle the Blender Camera Tracker. One question which you maybe have is why do you want to use Blender's Tracker instead of using PF Track, 3D Equalizer or Synthize? The answer for this is not so easy. Some people want to stay inside of their Blender production environment because they want to have their indie studio, indie production, everything in Blender. But I found that the Blender tracker is quite powerful in comparison to other tracking solutions and the Blender tracker is for free. So I think it's really worth to take a look into. If you look from the feature side onto this tracker, you will find that this tracker is quite good. It isn't fully automatic like other solutions, but it's really made more for supervised tracking, but it has a really strong tracking engine. You have a great lens workflow and also an object tracker, which is missing in other solutions. So you can use the Blender Tracker also with other 3D applications like Houdini, Cinema 4D, Maya or even NukeX, which lacks of an object tracker by default. I think it's worth to look into this Blender Tracker and the Blender Tracker is really good in supervised tracking, which is the tracking method which I use in practice most of the time. Let's talk about the concept of this series. Like in this series before, I want to bring you not only one big video where I show you, okay, so you make tracking in Blender. I want to teach you step by step a real curriculum so that you understand the tools and to look a little bit deeper into the different workflows which you find in Blender so that you can later adapt these workflows to your footage and your project. In this first tutorial, we want to talk about the preparation of footage and for this I will use the video sequence editor so that you also take a look into this part of Blender which you maybe never have opened. If you like these kind of tutorials please do me a favor, subscribe, give me a thumbs up and if you want to have the original footage which I use in this series you can get it on Gumroad for a small fee or on my Patreon but you can use your own footage and it's always good to work with your own stuff and your own projects so that you really learn how to use the stuff. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments below. But now let's get started. Like I said, we want to prepare our footage in the video sequence editor. And the reason for this is that we normally track not videos. You can track videos if you like, but normally we track image sequences. The reason for this is that sometimes if you track videos, the files get a little bit out of sync. Also, it's much, much faster to work with sequences because the engine doesn't have to decompress the footage first. And so it's really common that you use image sequences. So let's start now in the video sequence editor. Where do we find it? If we have here the start screen open, you can go here directly to video editing. So this is the fastest way of coming there, I think. Another way would be pressing Ctrl N or go to File New. And here you also find video editing. Let's switch over and take a look here. What do you get in this layout? In this layout, we have several panels. We have here on the left, a file browser. Then we have here this big area. This is the program monitor where you see your footage and your edit. Then we have here the properties. And this part here is our timeline, which we want to use for video editing. This editor, I have to confess, is not a full-fledged video editing system like, for example, DaVinci Resolve or Premiere Pro or Final Cut, but it's quite powerful in its own way. I use it for animatics and also for shot planning. It's quite worth to take a look into this workflow and it's a great tool which you have under your fingertips if you want, for example, to prepare some image sequences or make a fast cut for something. This here, like I've said, is now the timeline. And the first question is how to get footage into that. For this, this file browser here is opened. And what I do here is I want to have this panel first here in full screen. You can increase or maximize every panel inside of Blender with Control Spacebar. 
So hover over your mouse, press Control spacebar. Then we have here this file browser now full screen. I switched with these icons here to a list view so I can find my desktop a little bit faster. Here it is. And here are the trainings data, which I promised you. Here is the footage and I made a little list of folders which I want to use. I'm not sure if I use everything, but we start today in this stabilized footage. And here are two MOV files. So let's go here to the thumbnail view and you see we have here this street scene and also this well here. And we want to have this stabilized MOV file here, this street scene. Little side note, if we work in a project, it's really common that we always have to go to the same folders. And if you press the T key like tools, you get on the left side in the file browser always this list here of volumes and system volumes and so on. And you also have here bookmarks. Let's go back here for a moment. If we now work all the time here in this trainings data folder, if you like that, you can now make a bookmark for this with this little plus sign or the keyboard shortcut control B. And then we can always jump to this folder by clicking here. That's quite convenient. So let's go back to stabilize. I select that. And now I want to go out of the full screen. So control space bar. And now we can drag and drop our footage here into this sequencer. What you now see is something interesting. You see directly we have two of these things here. We name them strips inside of the video sequence editor. Let's analyze now what we see here. Like I've said, this is our program monitor and this is the timeline. And if you now make a closer look to these two panels here, you will see that this here, let's open that up is a video sequencer. So you see this little slide icon. And this here is also the video sequencer. But the video sequencer itself has three modes. A sequencer mode, a preview mode, and a sequencer and preview mode. That here is preview. And here you see it's sequencer. So you can switch that all the time here to make your layout like you want to have it. For example, some people want to have more than one preview. Other people say, I don't want to use this area here. I want to make this bigger and want to have the sequence and preview in one area here, which has the big advantage that if you use the N menu, I press the N here, that you have here this long area, which you can use through the whole screen. And if you opened up many sub panels here. You have more space than if you have here only, let's go back here, the sequencer. You need here the preview bigger and then you have to scroll a lot here. It's on you which layout you like more for that. Let's also get rid here of the file browser. So I go here on the left round corner of my preview, hold down the left mouse button and collapse these two. Now we have a little bit more space to talk about other areas here. The next question is, okay, we have now our footage here. What if I want to have more than one footage in the timeline? So there's another way of adding footage and this is common to Blender itself. So it's the add menu. You find in the sequencer here an add menu where you can add stuff and also shift A brings you to the add menu. I can go here now to movie, to sound, to image sequences, but we have other strip types which we maybe look into the next lessons. So let's take a movie here. You see we have again a file browser, but this time, and that's the better thing here. Let's take Waldbrunnen for this case. If we now have the end menu open here, we have options. So we have, for example, an option where we want to place the footage and what exactly we want to have, if we want to have sound or not, and what about the frame rate. I can demonstrate that really easily. So I say I have here after three seconds, for example, I want now to add footage. So I place my current time indicator here, shift A, movie, and now I select that and you see the start frame is now automatically set here to frame 90. And if you now place your footage, you see it's exactly at this point. So in my practice, I use Shift A most of the time and I don't need this file browser here. 
Okay, now we have two strips of footage, or better to say we have four strips. Really often the question comes, why do we have four strips now we only have two videos? We have blue strips here, which are the video channels, and we have these greenish ones, which is the audio. And we don't need audio at all, so select these here and press the X key for deleting. Now you can drag these strips here around like you want. You see, you can select them, you can drag them directly with the left mouse button down. What you also can do is you can select them, press the G key like grab and move them around here. What you also can do if you want to prevent going up and down here in the channels list, you can constrain them by pressing the X key or if we want to hold the timing, we can press the Y key. So we can't move it to the left or right, only up and down. These are typical Blender transformations and they work also with these strips, quite convenient. Then we have, like I've said here, the timeline. And this timeline looks a little bit strange because this here is really timed. We have seconds and frames at the moment. And if you want to work in frames, which I do mostly for visual effects, you can press Control T, like time, or you can go, I think it's here in the view menu. Yeah, here it is, show seconds. This is the option there you can switch it here to a frames view. And if we now make this here wider, you will see that at the moment, our program here is only 250 frames long, but our strips are longer. So this length of our program is inside the video sequence editor always cropped. So it's the same thing like in your 3D scene. You have to set your project. And for this, we use the same project settings like we use in the 3D world. So we can go here to the output properties and here's the start and end frame of our movie. Also, we find here the frame rate, which is quite important because if we have footage here with a different frame rate, Rendered everything is with this frame rate here. But 30 frames per second is absolutely okay for now. But keep that in mind. This is the frame rate of our program. And what you now can do is you can change here now the length of your program. What you also can do is we can go here with our time indicator to the last frame. By the way, navigating the time indicator here is drag and drop here on the blue area. What you also can do is you can use the old Blender style of scrubbing. So shift right mouse button over this view, also scrubs. You also can use your arrow keys left and right on your keyboard to move inside of the footage. And what you also can do, and this is something I use a lot later also in tracking, is you can hold down the Alt key. And it's not important if you are over the sequencer or here the preview. Hold down the Alt key and then use your mouse wheel. And with that, you can step through your footage and can exactly see what you want to see. I can now go here to the end of our program. So this is the last frame of this clip here. And we say that's, for example, now the end of our program, which we want to use. And it's frame 282. So what I can do now is here's the frame number. I can hover over this frame and press now Command C. You don't have to click into the field. So it's absolutely enough in Blender to hover over number field and copy. And then you can paste it here with Command V. Or you also can paste it here, Command V. And so this is then the new program length for your edit. What you also can do for keyboard shortcuts lovers is you can place here your current time indicator somewhere. For example, here in 240. And then use the control button on your keyboard and with the control and keyboard shortcut, you set the end of your program and with control home, you set the start frame, which I don't do at the moment, but it's possible. So command end and command home brings you to the first and the second frame. To jump around here inside the timeline, this is something I nearly forgotten, is shift left arrow and shift right arrow. So this brings you to the first and the last frame of your program, not the strip. Keep that in mind. Okay, now you know how to move inside of that here. The navigation is the same like in the 3D viewport, middle mouse button here, and zooming with the mouse wheel, 
if you like and if you home everything only the home key then you can see the full program here and now i want to talk a little bit about the strips here which we see let's select one of these strips and we make a little bit more space here and look on the right side here if you don't see this area press the n key please and then we see here that every strip has strip properties here is the name of the strip and also we can make a color code for these strips here which can be quite useful then we have here how these two strips composite with each other so you can change here the opacity we have here some modes which we can use we can transform here our footage around for frame in frame for example you can mirror them around and so on you see a lot of cool options which you can experiment with if you really want to dive deeper into the video editor but for our case quite important is here the source area because here is the link where the footage lives on your hard drive and the so named color space what is the idea behind the color space this is a quite important topic let's get rid first of this here because we don't use this footage we only want to use the street view here and if you have seen this footage with your video player on your system you maybe find that this footage here looks now different than on your hard drive in my case it's the same but it really depends how you started the video editor and this is a little pitfall for beginners if we have a footage here and let's look here yeah this is also srgb then you tell now the system okay that what you load here is srgb but maybe you load an image sequence which is an exr sequence and it's linear for example or you have a logarithmic file format or whatever you can select that here and you can switch it and so now blender knows exactly okay this is for example linear aces or this is linear and so on but the system which is used for your whole program or your project is set in the project settings it's the same like in the 3d world so if you go here to this render options and then go down here to the color management you see here that we have a display device so which kind of monitor do you use in our case srgb and then we have a view transform here i started this video sequence editor with the video editing template and so blender sets this view transform to standard so you don't have any view transform going on standard doesn't change anything but if you come from the 3D world and you only added the video editing inside of a 3D scene, then it's really likely that your view transform is still on Filmic because Filmic is the system which we use for 3D. And now you see that the footage looks grayish wrong. This is quite important. So if you are using this here now for video editing, you have to make sure that your view transform is not something else than standard standard is correct here also the sequencer here works in srgb at the moment the look is not so important the look is for filmic so if you are in filmic you can change here the contrast you see that here but if you go back to standard this should not do anything if it does like it's doing here at the moment you see this is quite dangerous go to none so the right settings are display device is srgb this is my monitor view transform is standard with no adjustment at all the gamma is one and the sequencer works in srgb and then you get really the right footage if you have set for your strip the right color space here which is mostly srgb but it can change depending what you are doing let's take now a look into our footage here so i go to the first frame shift left arrow and then press spacebar for play you see these little street scenes and cars are going here and you decide okay i want to make for the first project for example a stabilization to learn tracking inside of blender this plate here is filmed with hands so i shake a little bit 
and I'm not interested completely in the full program I want to start, for example, in frame 50. This is the frame I want later to have. And to change now the length of a strip, there are different ways. The first way which you normally use in editing could be that you say, okay, I want to split this clip here and delete a part which you don't like. And this splitting is done with the split command. Normally inside of Blender, since Blender 2.8, we have a tools approach. This was really great for beginners. Before Blender 2.8, everyone has to knew all the secret keyboard shortcuts and all the secret menus. And with 2.8, we suddenly had a toolbar. So if you press T here, we have a toolbar here, but you see it's quite useless. We only have two tools here. The Blender Sequence Editor and also the Movie Clip Editor, which we use later for tracking, is not revamped yet completely to this new idea that all the tools you have is also visual somewhere in a tools palette. So it's a little bit old school and I will teach you the important keyboard shortcuts, but keep that in mind, it's not completely there. And I hope in the next versions, also the tools which we use are coming here to the tools palette. If you want to split now a strip, we use the keyboard shortcut K like knife. If you have the strip selected here, you can press K and you see this strip is now split. One of the pitfalls is here that if you have by accident deselected the strip or you have selected the wrong strip, Blender doesn't cut the right one. So Blender always cuts what you have selected and it can be more than one strip, but you have to select it first. So K key and then we have the split here. Now you can select this here and press, for example, the X key to delete that. Now is a good time to explain what a handle is. Let's move the footage a little bit inside here and talk about handles. On the left and the right of every strip, we have this area here, which is a so named handle. This handle here is something like an in point and an out point, and you can drag it around to change the in and out point. So this is also a way of changing it. And you see the numbers here, the frame number is running. So if you know exactly you want to cut at frame 50, you can take that and move to frame 50, for example. But you don't see here a result of this tracking, which is sometimes annoying. And thanks to Blender 3.0, which is the release candidate here, we have a new function for this. For this, you have to go into the preview window and under view here, we have a preview during transform. I don't know if the programmers will add this really useful feature by default and also into the sequence window here. I don't find it yet, but yeah, if you know that it's there here in the preview under view preview during transform, then you can select here an in or out point. And while you are dragging now, you can really see what this point is. That's quite interesting. Another thing I want to talk with you about is flash. If you're an editor, you know what flash is. These are frames which are cutted at the moment, but they are still there. So if you now decide, for example, to move this in point here to the left, you will see that we still have flash or video content. Everything is still there. It's non-destructive. But if we go here, let's move that to the side, to the right side, we never cut it here something. So this was really the last frame of our program or our strip, better to say. If I now take this, and by the way, if you selected a handle, you can use the G key, for example, on your keyboard to move this handle here. So you don't have to really grab this, but it's only a convenient thing. If I go to the left, I remove images. But what happens now if I go to the right? We are now at the end of the original footage, the original strip, and then you see we can still extend. You see in the color that there's something different. This here is a freeze frame. You see Blender holds now the last frame, and this is really cool. But keep in mind, if you see this dark color here, this is not new footage. This is the last frame freezed out. Okay. I think now you know a little bit how to cut here and how to do something here. Let's place now our footage correctly and we start in frame number one. 
So I place this strip here now on one. We have cut it at frame 50. So the first frame looks like that here at the moment. And now we want to make sure that we only have real footage here. So let's bring that in. Okay, that's the last one, 220 here. And now this is the footage we want to use. Our program is still too long. And now we can use our new keyboard shortcut, Control and to set it, but not here, but we want to have it here. Let's make sure that you sit on the right frame, Control and here. And in my case, it's frame now one to 220. But it's not so important that you have the absolute right frame, but that's it. Let's check the whole thing here at the end so that it really fits. Okay, great. And now we can write the whole thing out. Let's go for this into the output properties, then go here to output. I go now into my folders. We want to get back in our trainings data into footage and I place now the image sequences in the same folder here than the original footage. So let's say this is the street here, street sequence, double click and we name it street sequence. Then I make a dot for pound signs for numbering the frames and then we make PNGs out of that. So make PNG, accept that. And in the output settings, we also have to make sure that the file format is correct. So let's go here and say we want to have PNG without an alpha because we don't have an alpha. So wasted space and color depth of the original footage is 8 bit. So we can stay in the 8 bit world, but we don't want to have any compression. And this is important. We don't want to introduce artifacts. So don't use JPEG if possible. Don't use compression because all these artifacts can make problems later in motion tracking. After everything is set up, this is set up correctly. Check our color management for the last time. Standard, nothing. Okay, we can now go to render, render animation, and now we get our image sequence. While this is rendering out, you see it's quite a nice system to work with. We can really make nice edits. And the full strength of the video sequence editor is that you also can add scenes without pre-rendering them and you can cut scenes, change cameras and so on. So it's a really powerful tool. Okay, everything is rendered out, great. And to check that now, we can load the image sequence directly here into this program only to check. So Shift A, image sequence. And now we see in this folder, this folder's street sequence. And now you see our frames here. They are numbered correctly. And one thing which is important to know in the video sequence editor, if you want to load a sequence, this is different from the movie clip editor, you have to select with the A key all these images and Blender will figure out how these images work. And if you now add that here, you see this is our sequence. Let's overlay them. A little tip here, if you drag something around and you really want to snap, you can hold down the control key and now you see we have snapping going on. This white line here is a snapper and so we can snap something. Now we can play this. You see, this is now the image sequence and below that we have now our original video. Everything is quite right here, so delete that. And now we've prepared our image sequence. At the end of this tutorial, I want to talk about some little tips and tricks which you maybe use in later lessons. So one thing which you have to keep in mind is that this year generates now in Blender 3.0 uh, proxies, which is quite cool. We will talk about proxies, I think, later in the Blender for production series again. But you have maybe seen that there is a cache folder inside of the folder which we have seen before. So the proxies are now generated automatically, but sometimes it happens. For example, you place an image sequence, which is EXR or so, that your RAM can't handle it. And that's mostly the point where Blender crashes. If you are out of memory with Blender, it crashes. 
And the funny thing is that this video sequence editor doesn't use your complete RAM. If you want to see how much RAM you use, you can go here to the status bar, make a right mouse button click, and here you see your system memory. If you have the feeling that now you have, for example, 64 gigs of RAM and Blender crashes here after 8 gig of reading something, you have to go into the preferences of your Blender. So go to Edit, Preferences, and here under System, you will see that here's a section for the video sequence editor, and this is the memory cache, which is able to use. I increased it a little bit to 4 gigs, but if you have much memory, you can add here more and more. And this is the memory the video sequencer uses, and also later the movie clip editor. So if you have problems with Blender crashing while it's caching something or so, you can increase that later. This is one thing. The other thing I want to talk with you about briefly is color adjustments, because if you want to track later, the most important thing for a tracker is that it sees contrasty details. We don't want to introduce artifacts, this is something we talked about, but we also want to make it easy for the tracker. And you can improve your footage for tracking purposes and then later replace it with the original footage. So if the timing is the same and the whole plate is the same, only you have changed the colors, that's absolutely okay. So improving colors and contrast is a good helper for the tracking process. To do that here, we have the concept of, for example, adjustment layers. We can add here a new strip type, adjustment layer, and make sure that it's here on the top and bring it over the whole program. And this strip type works absolutely the same like in other video editors of Photoshop or Affinity. It changes everything which is underneath it. If you now select this adjustment layer, we have here again strip properties. In these strip properties, we have, for example, color. So this is something which every strip has, yeah, this color information here, and one of the properties here is, for example, the saturation, which you can change. So sometimes it's more useful that you, for example, go to black and white and say, yeah, I want to use only a black and white plate here for tracking or you want later to multiply the whole plate here, whatever. I reset that by going over these fields and pressing the backspace here. Another thing which you can use is you really can dive into color signs. And for this, we use modifiers on this trip. So if you go here now to modifiers, we have here a list of modifiers. And one side note, I normally use then linear, so they calculate in linear space. The same thing would be here if you are here under color, you convert it to float values first, if you like, before you do that. Yeah, but we resetted that. So let's go back here to linear modifiers. And now we have here some color corrections. And what I use here, for example, is color balance. And in color balance, we get now these color balance wheels here. Lift, gamma, and gain here you can now work with. And if you don't like these names, you also can change them to offset power and slope. But yeah, lift, gamma, and gain is easy. If you now want, for example, to increase contrast, what you can do is you can go to your gamma here, for example, and lower your gamma. You see, if you normally lower the gamma, you have the midpoint and you bring it down. And if you see that as a histogram curve, you bring down the mids. And then you go to the gain, which is the same like multiplication, and multiplication lifts the highlights. And with this work, lower the gamma and bring up the gain, you increase contrast. We can see that if we make this bigger here, and I select now this adjustment layer, and you can hide the layer the same like 3D objects. You can press the H key, you see this was the original footage, and if I activate it with Alt H again, you will see that has here much more contrast. So this is one way of working with that. So you have seen you can reduce the saturation, you can change the colors, whatever helps to get better features. I think that's enough for today. I hope you learned something here and you now can prepare your footage for the tracking process. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments below. 
and see you in the next lesson. You are Helga Maus.